Hello everyone and welcome back to The Colour Cave where we like to play with art stuff. My name is Gem and today we are going to do some watercolouring. Not only are we watercolouring but we are watercolouring in a colouring book. This has been a request from quite a few people, um, Cassie and Shilpa and I think one of the Sandys, I can't quite remember which one. It is something that I've been wanting to do myself but I did want to wait until my watercolour skills were a little bit better because it's something I'm still quite new at. So today is the day. Whether you want to follow along or just see you know, what I'm doing in, uh, in the book that we're going to work in, let's just get going and see how it goes. We are going to be working today in Ticket to Dreams by Karolina Kubikowska and I have picked this book specifically because of the thickness of the paper. It is very, very thick and that is just going to help it take some of the water. So the picture I am going to be working on is this one here. Now I did have a little go already. I did like a test run on this side because I wanted to see how the paint was going to behave on the paper because this is new to me as well. And and every type of paper and depending on what paint you use will sort of turn out differently. So the other reason I wanted to do this is I wanted to keep the background the same on both of these pages. So I wanted to do it while I had the paint mixed already. So let's uh, just pop this over. So we're going to square this up a little bit here. The paints that I'm using today is the 24 set of the Gansai Tambi watercolours. I haven't used these for a long time. Uh, when I first started playing with watercolour, I used these and I learned very quickly that they behave slightly differently to more traditional watercolour or western watercolour. The reason that I want to use these is that they are quite vibrant and so when we're working in a colouring book, then that sort of vibrancy and also the opacity of it is going to suit us a lot better. So the first thing I have done is I have picked out the colours for this and I have mixed the colours slightly. So I have used the really dark blue, which is the number 67. So that is this one here. And I've just watered that down slightly. I haven't mixed it with anything else. The other colour that I have used is 139, which is the one next to it. And, it look, and these ones down here all look really dark, but this is actually a really nice shade of purple. So what I've done is I've mixed that with a little bit of the pink, which is the number 36 up here. And I've added a tiny, tiny spot of this, this indigo blue colour, this 67. And again, I've just watered it down. So that's the two colours that you can see on this side. And I've just got them popped in a palette here. So what we're going to do is we are going to do exactly the same thing on this side. So we'll do the background first and then we can let it dry and we can go from there. I've got two paint brushes on the go for this. I have got uh, my Winsor & Newton Cotman number no. 8 round. This is kind of like my uh, everyday paint brush. I do a lot with this and I seem to get on well with most types of painting just using this one brush. I have heard a lot of people say that they do the same but with a number six, so it's just your preference. So I've been using that for the purple colour and then I've also got a much smaller brush here and this is a number three round and this is just a cheap uh, ro uh, ro <laughs> Royal and Langnickel brush that came in a pack and they're supposed to be, uh, you're supposed to be able to use them for different paint mediums. Um, I find they're okay for watercolour so I've been using that for the blue. So that's the two brushes I've got on my go. Obviously I've got a pot of water there as well and my paint is quite watery. When you're mixing your paint colours and you're diluting them with water, it's always a good idea to test them out on a scrap sheet of paper so that you can gauge whether or not you have enough transparency in what you're doing. Obviously the less water you have, particularly with these Gansai Tambi paints, the more opaque and vibrant the colour is going to be. Just to give you a quick demonstration of that, if I take the, if I just wet my brush and dip it into this purple colour straight into the pan and put it down on paper, you can see that it's a really rich and quite a dark purple, whereas I have added enough water just to make it a little bit lighter because I don't want it overpowering our butterfly that's in the front of the picture. So, one of the things that I wanted to try out was the, the different ways that we can we can use watercolour in this book. And I have sort of learned a little bit already from doing this side. So what we want to try and do is work in sections. Now, the, the paper will absorb the water quite quickly, so you have to be quite generous with it on your brush. And don't worry about buckling. As I say, this paper is 
quite thick, it can take quite a lot of water. What you don't want to do is scrub. But a bit like Inktense pencils, we have to work quickly because that paper will absor absorb the water. We want to be able to keep working without having too many sort of tied lines, you know, where one part's dried before we've uh, we've managed to sort of spread it out where we want it. So I'm trying to work in sections here. Now that's a good cut off point so I can stop there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm taking my other brush and I'm literally just dipping it in to the blue and then plonking a, a splodge or two and I'm doing that completely at random. And I am going to let that behave whichever way it wants and I'm going to let it go wherever it wants. And that's kind of part of the fun of doing this kind of background. It's very loose and you're you're kind of letting the the paint do do what it likes. When you are putting the the blue in, make sure that your page is still quite damp or else it's just going to sit where you've you know where you've popped the paintbrush down. But see this is just a little adventure today. I thought it would be fun to try and someone had suggested it as something they would like to see. I'm not a huge fan of using water-based mediums and colouring books because I really don't like the buckling in the paper so I have to be quite satisfied that you know whatever book I'm going into is quite robust in terms of paper because I don't like all the, the sort of crinkliness that goes on. Now you can go back over the top of some of your blue patches once they've soaked in a little bit. I'm not intent on getting an absolutely smooth background. I don't want that. If I'd wanted a completely smooth background, I would use another medium. So don't be sort of frightened to have, you know, lines and sort of watermarks and things because that's it's part of the fun of watercolour and it's what makes it interesting. Otherwise, you could just stick to pencil or marker or, you know, any other medium. You've got to have fun with it. So I'm going to do all these little patches in here first. But you can see that's starting to dry already. You can tell by the texture of the paper starting to go a bit mottled there. That's it starting to dry out. So but the good news um, because of that is that it, <laughs> it doesn't take too long. Now we're working in quite a large area now. So we want to work quite quickly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start in this corner up here. And I'm going to come down here. And then I'm going to try and work my way across probably to here. That's a good place to stop. And we have to make sure we're getting into the corners or these nooks and crannies past the spiral binding and spiral binding is something that I absolutely detest in colouring books I really do um it's I find it very awkward I know some people like it because it lays the book flat but going in between all these bits when you've got double pages I find it very very irritating I suppose for single-sided books it would be okay but being left-handed as well single-sided books aren't my favorite thing because the the printed pages tend to be on the right hand side and when you're left handed it means that this gets in the way when you're trying to colour. So you end up in the same position as having a bound book where you end up having to turn the page so that you can get into, you know, into the, the crease or into the spine. So I'm just going to start plonking a little bit of blue there. So be quite brave with it. You don't need to, don't need to shy away from it. And I'm not being particularly careful here. Again, just the way that this paint behaves with this paper, I can be quite sort of liberal with it and it will, you know, it'll do its own thing and it'll sort itself out. If you're looking for more precise colouring in terms of paint, then I would say using a, a, a more sort of methodical approach, you know, working in lines, if you're going to mow a lawn like this, that would probably be a be better way to do it. But see, I really wanted this sort of nice, loose colour in the background, just to go with the idea that, you know, our butterflies may be flying about a little bit. And yeah, it's just a, a sort of more stylistic choice. So you can see how much that's spread out because I've put it onto the wet purple and that's exactly what I wanted to achieve. Now I'm just working my way around. I'm not doing anything special here. I'll just make sure that I'm not leaving any sort of gaps or anything, make sure I'm covering all the paper. But you can see how quickly that's drying off. So it is important to kind of get, get a wiggle on when you're putting this down and be quite liberal. I haven't put anything underneath the page, you know, behind this page to protect it. And it seems to be okay. Um, 
so far. So that's good. The other thing I really like about this book as well is because Carolina has quite a loose drawing style, you don't feel as if you have to stay exactly within the lines when you're doing stuff like this. You know, if you go over a little bit, it's fine because her lines aren't you know, uniform and crisp. They're very sort of sketchy. And it's one of the things I just like about her art style. I really do. You have to be, I think anyway, you have to be a very confident artist to leave the lines that weren't really supposed to be there. I don't know if that makes sense or not. It makes sense in my head. But, um, you know, because obviously when you draw something out, if you sketch something, you want to make sure that things look the shape they're supposed to and there's always going to be sketch lines that don't belong to that shape but uh, you know and you want to erase them that is your that's your sort of mission that's what you know what sketching's all about but Carolina is quite happy to just leave them there it's like yeah I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with this <laughs> so there we go I'm working in great big strokes now and this is where having a size 8 brush is quite helpful because you can cover that area quite quickly. You will go through a lot of paint. Always mix way, way more paint than you think you need because I can guarantee if you run out and you have to, you know, if you have to mix some more, it can be very difficult to get the same shade or the same hue again. So that is, uh, you know, especially if you're working with pan watercolours like these, you can also get watercolours in a tube. But, I mean, look at the, I mean, these pans are massive in the Gansai Tambi paints. So don't be frightened that you're going to waste paint because you, you, you're really not. So I'm just going to add a little bit more purple into what I'm doing here because I noticed that some of the pigment is sitting at the bottom where I've mixed the colours. So I just want to make sure that I'm going to get roughly the same hue again. And again, I'm going to start from over here, being left-handed. But that, see, this is drying really quickly. This part's just, it's barely damp and no more. So I'm not too worried about sticking my my hand in it. And it has been known. I'm sure you guys are, are aware of that. <laughs> I'm pretty good at sticking my hand in things. And then we're just going to start coming out here. We have all this black of the butterfly as well, which is really helpful. So again, if you're, you know, if you if you go over the lines a little bit, it's not... It's not a huge deal. So yeah, I would really like to try these paints now that I'm a little bit more experienced. And I don't mean that in the skill sense. I just mean that I've, you know, I, I'm more familiar with the paint now. I would really quite like to try these Gansai Tambi paints on rice paper, which is what they were originally designed for. And it would be quite nice to try those things out. So that's something that I might look into and see if I can get some rice paper. And I could maybe do a video on that. If anybody would be interested in seeing that, please let me know in the comments. I'm just going to go back over this a little bit. See, this is rather a large area to be working in. I could have used a bigger brush for this area. And I would have less patchiness. But as I say, I'm quite happy to, to have this slightly uneven background. Because it's all part of the charm. There might be some areas where... It's a bit too obvious, but we can soon touch that up and fix it up. So I'll take this up here. And you can see my paper is starting to buckle slightly at the top, but that is absolutely A-OK. -okay. So, I mean, you can mess about with this. You can let it dry and you can put another layer on. I would maybe be a bit less liberal with the water on the second layer, just so that you don't destroy the paper. But, I mean, we're not going to do anything else to this now. The, the background is as it is. And that is the first step. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to let that dry and then we'll pop back in and we can work on some of the details. Right, now that we're nice and dry, we can move on. So the next thing we're going to do is the butterfly wings, which is probably the most exciting part. And I've gone with the idea of a monarch butterfly and they have these beautiful shades of orange and yellow and a little bit of red. So I thought that would be really nice to try out. So what I'm going to use is the number 43, which is this sort of golden yellow colour. I'm also going to use 31, which is this sort of orangey red. And I've mixed two of these together to give me a nice bright orange as well. So that's going to allow us to do a sort of gradient. So what we want to do is start, we'll start with our palest colour, but these I'll split it up into the top part of the wings first. So these parts, which I'm go, mostly going to keep orange and red. Now off to the side here as well, I've just got a little rag and it's just for me after I've dipped my brush to clean it, I'm just sort of wiping it off there. 
And again, that was another handy hint from new cavers was not to use paper towels, but just to keep a rag. And I do actually like using rags. I keep a paper towel with me sometimes too, but uh, I mostly, mostly use rags. So I'm just gonna start flicking this in here. And I'm probably gonna bring that to about there, I think. Give my brush a quick whip round in there. And then I'm gonna grab some of my red color and just start at the other end. You can see it is quite an orangey red and I can bring this down. And I'm just gonna let that run into each other. And then just with a clean wet brush, I can start to smoosh it together, which is one of my favorite things to do, period, when it comes to art. You know, I like to smoosh my pencils together. I like smooshing paint together too. <laughs> I uh, I hate to admit this, and I knew I was going to have to admit to it to you guys sometimes, but I'm actually secretly enjoying painting now. <laughs> if you think back to that first tutorial video that I followed, and uh, you know where I did the the sort of scenery, I'm just gonna add a little bit more orange in here. I was so frustrated. I was so stressed out. I was not a happy camper, and I'm pleased to report that that has changed dramatically. And I actually quite enjoy painting now. Who'd have thunk it? Right, so let's pop this up here. I, I still maintain though, and I think I'm going to say it forever. I, um, even if I've been painting for 20 years, I'll still be like, I'm not a painter. I consider myself a sketcher. I am, I am like pencil through and through. I think if you cut me open, I would be made of pencil inside. And uh, the, the painting thing's definitely secondary. But it, it's nice that I'm enjoying it because I really thought that I wouldn't. And I, especially after trying that, that uh, you know, that sort of follow along, I, uh, oh man, I was like, I'm never painting again. <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. But I am, I'm enjoying it. Even if it's not, if I'm not creating wonderful pieces of art, it kind of doesn't matter to me. So you can see this is starting to dry now. It started to soak in. And that's just given this lovely gradient from the red through to the orange. I'm really pleased with that. So we're going to keep going and do all these top parts of these wings the same way. There's a little bit too much paint sitting on here for my liking, so I'm going to use the thirsty brush technique, which is where you take a clean brush and you make sure that it's just no more than damp and you can actually dab on to what you've done and it will, what we say with a Scottish tongue is, soak it up, it sucks the paint back up into the brush. So that's really helpful if you feel as if you've got too much water or too much paint on a piece of work. You can use that technique, but you do have to make sure that the brush is clean and reasonably dry. It doesn't have to be bone dry, but it needs to be a little bit damp. And that technique works well, especially when you're like me and you make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> it's really handy to be able to do that to lift the paint back up. I'm not scared of mistakes. I'm like the messiah of making mistakes when it comes to doing artwork especially when I'm filming it I seem to make more more mistakes when I'm filming but I am absolutely fine with it I never pretend to be something that I'm not when it comes to art so <laughs> and it's learning do you know what I mean and if it helps someone else learn a lesson then I'm even more for it because it stops you guys making the mistakes I, I make the mistakes for you <laughs> okay so let's do this one in here and I want this one to be a little bit more vibrant so I'm just going to add a wee bit more paint down on top of that and we can always go back over that's the nice thing about watercolour if you think it's a bit wishy-washy you always have the option to let it dry and then you can go back over it because watercolour is designed to be layered so that is really helpful and there we go look at that colour it's such a gorgeous colour it kind of reminds me of a, a drink called a Harvey Wallbanger. That's quite an old-fashioned cocktail, but I'm sure there'll be a few of you out here there that knows what one of them is. I love Harvey Wallbangers. I don't drink them anymore. I haven't had, had one for at, at least a decade, but they're, they're tasty. Make your teeth fall out right enough. They're so sweet. <laughs> right, so just because of the angle of the wings, we've got slightly less space to work in here, but it's just the same principle, just in a slightly tighter gap. Ordinarily, I would do all the orange parts first and then you know if I was working in pencil I would do all the orange parts first and then pick up my red but because this is soaking into the paper quite quickly I just want to work section by section 
so that we're um, so that we're going to get the gradients in that we want with that tiny little space. I could probably do these two together. To be fair, they're close enough together. Ooh. See, this is fun. I don't know. You know, this is this is not stressful at all. This is fun because you're just squishing the paint down. There's not really anything technical about it or difficult about it. Once you've got your paint colours mixed, and I often find that that's the hardest part. If you have an idea in your head of exactly what colour of paint you want on something, it sometimes takes you a little while to, you know, just to, to get the colours right and you have to do a bit of tweaking. But that's something that just comes with practice. And if you have a, a, a knowledge base of colour theory from anywhere else, like... Uh, using markers or using pencil it's actually quite easy I thought it would be really difficult because I wouldn't say that my color theory is particularly strong but just by doing you know you learn as you go and um, yeah so I've, I've found that mixing colors with watercolor is a lot easier than I thought I should really learn to have a little bit more faith in myself sometimes I think I automatically think that something's going to be really difficult because I've never done it before. But there's lots of transferable skills in art between one medium and another. So, you know, you get there. Look at that. That's looking really cool already. Look how little effort that took. Like, seriously, guys, don't ever be scared of stuff like this. There was a point, I know that's easy for me to say, but I have taken um, like a massive leap of faith in stuff like this and just gone for it. And it's... It's been nothing but beneficial and I wouldn't change it because I've learned so much so quickly. I've had pretty steep learning curves. Bearing in mind that I only really started arting not even a year and a half ago. And here I am sitting here all blasé with watercolours and a colouring book like, yeah, this is great, look, it's dead easy. I do think sometimes though that maybe I don't I don't want to speak for other people because that that's not fair. But in my experience, I think sometimes we're more worried about judging ourselves rather than what anyone else is going to think of our art we're, we're more concerned about what we're going to think of our art and there's that sort of constant idea of oh you know we might fail and uh, largely I have um, learned to ignore that little doubting voice in the back of my head and that's been in part it's been forced by doing the channel obviously because there are certain things that i been forced to do like the scroller challenges it's actually been a good thing right so down on this bottom part now I think what we'll do is these larger sections I'm going to go with yellow and then I'll have a little bit of the orange here and then on these outer parts you know just down here I think we'll do what we we did at the top so in these middle sections I want the yellow to be quite prominent because it's the only place we're using the yellow. I'm just going to move my palette over a bit because I'm stretching away over for the neat paint. There we go, that's better. It's just there now. So because it's the only place that we're using the yellow, I want these sections to be mostly yellow. Now some of you might find you get on better with a smaller brush because these sections are quite tight. As I say, I'm quite comfortable with a number eight now, so I'm just going to soldier on with that. Pop it in at the top here and then sort of smoosh it down towards. Now that's interesting, that's mixing in a really strange fashion. It's gone in a sort of marbled effect. Can you see it? It's actually sort of just gone into lines and I'm t it's too small a space for me to squish it about. So that's interesting. That's what I'm saying about these watercolours, they behave slightly differently. Um, especially with the amount of water I've used, uh, I would have assumed that they would have just, you know, all sort of swoosh together but there you go that's okay I'm just gonna leave that like that and see what happens this can be a little experiment <laughs> all about the experiments it's my scientific side that's a conversation that really annoys me at work you know people talk about having you know having a scientific brain or having a, a creative brain and I always say to people oh, I must be a contradiction because I've got both I have a very very strong logical and scientific side and hence the reason I did my degree in what I did. And also the fact that I, I enjoy my job. I do a lot of analysis in my job and I really like numbers. I've got a head for numbers. But there is this part of me that just screams out that needs creativity. And I always have to have some sort of creative pursuit. 
And I think it's just to give my brain a break, to be honest, from the, you know, the, the more sort of scientific things. I'd love to hear if anyone else is like that as well, if they've got two sides to them. Or whether they are just a, an arty person. It's like, I was one of those weird kids at school that liked maths. <laughs> I wasn't, like, amazing at it, but I just, I didn't... Once I, you know, you figured out how to do something... You know, once you knew a formula for something or the method to do something, I found a lot of comfort in maths because it was you always had to use the same way to work something out and you knew that the answer would be the answer because you'd worked through this process or formula. And I found that very comforting because once you got the hang of the, the concept of what you were being taught, you knew it would be right every time as long as obviously you, you were counting right. Um, and I really like that about maths. But I say I like numbers and I remember numbers... As an adult now, I keep track of a lot of things and obviously the YouTube channel is one of them and I, I love the analytics page. I could sit there and look at that all day and it's something that's, uh, you know, I, I do it and I do it without thinking about it. I'm very good for remembering dates and I do make like mental notes of dates, which is, you know, and it's things like that don't matter at all, but I just like to, just like to do it, which is, I don't know if that's weird or not. Okay, so let's try this little section down here. I really should have started over this side, but I got really excited with myself, so... <laughs> yeah, my bad. I'll not panic too much. As I say, this dries really quickly, so I'm not overly concerned. So down here, we'll have the orange, <coughs> excuse me, and we'll have it going into the red colour like we did up here. And I only want a tiny bit of red, so let's get this orange down. I'm trying to stay out of the black areas because when you wet those black areas, it does stain it and you can sometimes see it after it's dried, which is uh, obviously what we we don't want. Oh, that is way too much paint. Oh, ho, 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 ho. I'm getting really over enthusiastic here. I can fix this, it's fine. Then I'll just shush it down towards the orange. It'll be okay. There we go. That's fine. I'll be okay. <laughs> Do you think I'm getting overconfident, guys? <laughs> is, that, is this a problem? <laughs> the other thing that I've really noticed as well recently, generally, with my colouring and with my art, is that you've heard, you'll have heard loads of people talk about uh, your work going through that ugly stage. And this last little while, I've become a lot more relaxed about that. And I because before I would look at my art or my colouring and be like, oh, this is going to be a disaster. I hate this, I, you know, I don't even know why I'm continuing. I've always continued with it though, even if I didn't like it. And I think that what, although it's important to get the foundation right, now whether that's base colours in your colouring pages or whether it's sketching, you know, if you're, if you're drawing or painting something, the fundamentals have to be right, obviously. But you, you, the, what actually makes the picture the picture is how you sort of finish it off. It's not those beginning sort of base layers, it's what you do on top of that. And I think I've kind of got to grips with that. Now that I'm a bit more confident in my, like, especially my like my sketch and my rough sketch, and that's really helped me to kind of ignore the ugly stage and just sort of power through it, knowing that nine times out of 10, not every time, but nine times out of 10, it's going to be all right. And it, it'll be, you know, it'll be the way I want it to be when I'm finished. And that is something that I honestly never thought would happen. I thought I would always have that self-doubt, you know, when, when your piece is in its ugly stage. But I'm really pleased to say that it still happens and I recognise it and I think, oh yeah, we're in the ugly stage. But it's more like a, an observation rather than a panic or a, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with this to fix it? Because I'm not fixing it, it's still a work in progress. You only have to fix something when you've made a mistake. And the ugly stage is not a mistake. It's just it's just part of the the process of drawing. It's like um it's like putting your underwear on before you get dressed. Nobody wants to see you in your underwear, well maybe apart from your spouse or your you know your partner, but it's a sort of fundamental step of getting dressed and you have to go through it. So you know same thing. So the next there you are the next time you're working on something it gets to the ugly stage. Just uh just think of like yourself in your underwear before you put your clothes on. <laughs> That's a terrible analogy. I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that are quite happy in their underwear. <laughs> Where do I think these things up? Oh, honestly. Mr. James says to me sometimes, he says, I wonder about you. Sometimes I think you're not wired up right. He may be correct. Right, there we go. I'm going to have a little zoom out now so that we can have a little look at this. Oh, it's pretty. <laughs> It's so pretty. I'm going to let that dry a little bit. 
I've got a funny feeling I kind of want to go back over my oranges here because they're looking a bit washed out compared to my yellows. But I'm going to leave this to dry and I'm going to wait until that's dry before I make any decisions on that. Okay, this is nearly dry now and I'm actually quite happy with it as it is. I've decided I'm going just to leave it be. So I'm going to nip over to the other side now and do the other wing. I'm just uh, sorting out my brush again here because it's been in the red. I need to make sure that absolutely all of that is out before I start dipping it back in my yellow. I could use another paintbrush, but I'm strangely attached to this paintbrush. I have noticed that it's the coating on it is starting to split. I don't know whether maybe it's been sat in water too long, but I tend not to leave my brushes sitting in water. It's not something I'm guilty of, so I don't know. That's a handy hint. See, if you're someone that's new to watercolouring or you don't do a lot of it, have two pots of water. Have one to clean your brush in and one to dip your clean brush in to start painting again. That really helps to keep your colours separate, especially if you're using a really pale colour like yellow. And uh, that was a handy hint I picked up from, from somewhere else. <laughs> but it does, it absolutely does work and it's, I found it to be really helpful. That is a tiny skinny little section. And then I can give my brush a, a little... I, I keep going to use Scottish words. We talk about having a skiddle and a skiddle is like playing about in water. Like you would put a baby in the bath and they, you know, they splash about in the water. That's having a skiddle. That, that sort of stretches out and extends to, you know, if you were to like wash your hands quickly in the sink or get, you know, rin rinse out a cup. You, you know, you would give it a skiddle in the sink because you're just sort of squishing it about in the water. So there you go. There's another good, uh, another good Scottish word for you today. But that that is quite. A, I find it quite an effective word. So much so that Mr. Jem uses it, and some of you will know Mr. Jem is English. So it's really really funny to hear him say that word in his funny English accent. It makes me laugh every time. But I also think it's incredibly sweet that he that he's using Scottish words. He has lived in Scotland quite a long time now, so I suppose it was going to happen. But it just sounds really funny with his accent. But I, I quite like it. <laughs> Okay, let's do this big section here. Oh, wow, this is a disaster. Right, I'm going to try and clean this up a little bit because it's gone way over into the black there and it just looks really untidy. So again, thirsty brush, just soak some of that up. Everything will be okay. There we go, that's better. Yes, yeah, skiddle's a good word. The other word that we use a lot that people seem to like because it's quite descriptive is if something is wobbly or shaky, it's shugly. And we would talk about a, a, like a shugly table leg and it just means that it's the table's wobbly. But it is, that is very, you know, it's a very descriptive word. There, are, there I mean, there are a lot of, of old Scottish words that are, that even I don't use, that maybe my, like, my grandmother would use. And she, she, although she's a, a very, what I would call a very well-spoken Scottish person. And again, I refer back to the, um, the TV commercial that I'd linked under one of my videos about uh, driving like grands in the car <laughs> but yeah I would say my, my my gran has a very proper Scottish accent but she uses a lot of old Scottish words and they're not it's not that they're slang it's just that they're old fashioned words uh, and some of them are great but in my sort of general day-to-day -day vocabulary you know I wouldn't necessarily use them I'm trying to decide <sighs> this part down here I don't know whether should be I suppose that should be yellow and orange shouldn't it yeah, these, these two, yellow and orange, and then these one, yeah, okay. I just had to sort that out in my mind. Sometimes I find vocalising things like that helps. And it's nice because I've got an excuse to do it, because technically I'm talking to you guys. I still do it, I'm not going to lie. See, when I'm on my own and I'm not filming, I still do it all the time. Or I pretend I'm talking to the dogs, you know, I'll ask the dogs, what do you, th what do you think about this, guys? This I need to fix this, don't I? And they just sit and look at me like, you're not saying the B word, B-I-S-C-U-I-T. And you're not saying the W word, W-E. I can't spell that one. But uh, yeah, that, that helps sometimes. I do actually, like, if I'm if I'm in the house, I do wonder about talking to myself, but I'm talking to the dogs. If anybody else is on their own most of the day, do you do that too? Do you talk to your cat? Do you talk to your fish? My mum had a massive rubber plant called Charlie, and she used to talk, talk to Charlie all the time. I wouldn't go that far, but... Yeah, glad it's not just me. Obviously get it from my mum. <laughs> my gran said that to me one day when I was talking to her on the phone. She said, um, if you if you stop and listen to your mum, as in my mum, she like gives herself a running commentary. It's like her monologue, but she vocalises it. 
and uh, you know my my mum will go up to my grand's and maybe like do a bit of cleaning for her or whatever and she's just sort of pottering about the house doing whatever my grand needs her to do and my grand says she's chatting away to herself the whole time and I'm like she's keeping herself company <laughs> I say I do it as well I think though because I work from home you know, I, I don't have colleagues in the vicinity that I'm talking to. It's just customers on the phone that I'm speaking to. And I, I spend a huge chunk of my day on my own because Mr. Jem works really long hours. So I think it's um like a coping mechanism, but I, I'm not a person that feels lonely. I'm quite happy in my own company. Uh, but maybe it's just something I do because I don't speak to a lot of people face to face. I'm going to have to be careful here that I don't push this into some of these other areas that are still a bit damp I'll be okay I do enjoy it's mostly far it's farmers I it's not mostly it is farmers I speak to on the phone and I talk to them about disease testing and uh, it's actually quite nice some don't really want to talk to you because maybe they're busy or some just don't want to speak to you because you're going to tell them what to do but there's some, and it tends to be older farmers, like, and it's usually older gentlemen, and maybe they're by themselves, or you know, maybe their their wife stays in the house, so when they're out at work, they're on their own too, and they like to have a really good gab, <laughs> and they they talk to you about the state of farming and how everything's so terrible and how hard they've worked for sixty years, and you get like their entire life story, and then they start talking about politics and what they're doing with their cows, and it's it's really funny, and they obviously just want somebody to have a chat to, which I think is really nice, because I'm happy to be that person that they chat to. You've got to be careful, obviously, with the subject matter. If it turns to politics or religion, or uh, thing you know, slightly dodgy topics like um sexual orientation, I've had that one too. Uh, it's you've got to try and stay as neutral as possible and try and stay professional. But I think you find that sort of border between being friendly and still being professional and then you know sort of venturing into dangerous territory but I have been doing jobs where um you know I've I've been dealing with customers whether it's face to face or on the phone and I've done that for a large chunk of my life so I'm very well practiced at it and uh, it's not something that ever phases me but farmers especially and I don't know what it's like in other countries but Farmers in the UK are, are usually quite sort of blunt and to the point, you know, there's no messing about, they're very direct and a spade's a spade kind of thing and they just come out with stuff and they don't think about what they're saying in terms of like how would that go down in a social situation, it's just that's the way things are and I kind of notice it a little bit about myself, there's things that we'll talk about you know, Mr. Gem and I, or, or even with our farming friends, and it's conversations and discussions you would never have in a social group anywhere else. Like, you wouldn't do it. And we kind of forget sometimes that that's not, outside of farming, that's just not the way the world works. But I think because we, we work in the industry that we do, it's just kind of nature to us. But I am very aware of it. And uh, I remember... The, the, we had an, not an incident but at Christmas time my, my parents always come and visit us at Christmas and stay with us uh, over the festive period and it's the only time I ever have Mama and Papa Gem together which is really nice and uh, <laughs> we started calving our cows just uh, before Christmas so obviously we had babies popping out everywhere was, Mr Gem was quite busy so we were sat down for dinner a couple of nights before Christmas and my mum and dad were sitting at the table and so were Mr. Jem and I. And I'd asked Mr. Jem how his day was going. And he started talking about this um this calf that was stillborn, but he was talking about it in quite, you know, considerable detail. And we were just talking away and I looked over and it was the expression on my mum's face and I it looked as if she was gonna vomit into her dinner. And um, Papa Jem's fine with it because he grew up on a farm. My my mum did not. And she was just like kind of going a bit green around the gills. So I looked over at Mr Jem and I was like, well, we'll finish talking about this after dinner. And he looked at me and I kind of nodded towards mum and he was like, oh, okay. And it was then that, you know, he realised what he'd been talking about while someone was eating kind of thing. My dad found it hilarious. I found it really funny, but I felt sorry for mum because she, bless her, she's trying to eat her tea. <laughs> Um, and it's things like that. You do forget you're so used to it every day. Um, it's, uh, it's it's just not, not quite for everyone. 
<laughs> okay, okay, there we go. They look quite pretty, don't they? I'm quite liking this. I don't know about these parts here because she's kind of hatched them in, but I think I'm just going to leave them white because if you look at a monarch butterfly, they do have these white spots. And I especially think once we've coloured in the rest of it, those will just pop out quite nicely. I think that'll be okay. So the bodies are kind of like a black, very, very dark brown colour. And she's kind of like scribbled in these parts in each section of the body. So in these dark parts with the sort of white, areas in the you know the scratchy bits I'm just going to leave them white and these stripes I'm going to colour in a really dark brown so the colour I've got I'm just consulting my little chart here is number 47 because all of these um colours <coughs> excuse me in the palettes they, they've just got numbers and everything else is all in um in Japanese symbols so sorry Japanese characters so what I did was I made a sort of little swatch chart with the numbers underneath so I know what's what that's the easiest way to do it. So number 47, but I, I mean, I don't I don't struggle with it at all, but the, the ones down the bottom here are saying to, they're all very dark and most of them look black and they're actually not. So I found it easier just to swatch them out. I do that with my other watercolours as well, to be fair, but they're a bit easier to distinguish. This brush is really, really wet. I want to have the brush a little bit drier this time and I'm just using the very tip of that brush. Some of you might get on better with a smaller brush for this kind of area if you're not, again, maybe if you're not a frequent water colour, colourist, water colour, I was going to say water colourer. <laughs> I kind of find it the same as using a pencil though because when I'm doing detail work I do hold my paintbrush really far down, you know, the way they would, I would if I was holding a pencil, so it, it's it's not that different. And I have been practising a lot to be fair. And you'll see that, I mean, it's manifested itself in my videos. I do have quite a few watercolour videos and varying shapes and forms. But I am, uh, truthfully, I'm beginning to enjoy it now. I don't think it'll ever be my main hobby in terms of what I do with art, but it's, it is enjoyable. So I've just added a little bit extra paint around the left-hand side here, made that a little bit darker. And again, because I'm working with it quite dry in comparison to, you know, like over here, it's kind of staying in place, you know, it's sticking. And that's just putting in a little bit of shading kind of idea. So I do it all the way down here. Why not? Again, that's the beauty. Because the paper's absorbing the paint and the water quite quickly, you can do that. Okay, okay, right. Now we're going to look at greens. I don't think I'm going to mix any colours for uh, for these leaves because I have a plethora of greens and some of them are really nice earthy shades. I was kind of thinking I would go number 53 and then I could use 54 as like a like a shadow colour. That might work quite nicely. So I think we'll go for that. So what I'm going to do here is, I do want it to be quite pale to begin with. So I've got a little plastic pipette. That's all from the lab at work. Shh. <laughs> and I'm just going to plop a couple of drops of that in there. Just enough to kind of cover the bottom of the, of the palette. And then I'm going to take my green colour that I picked out, which, what did I say, 53? So I'm going to take that and just give my paintbrush a really good scrub in there and then dip it into the water and skiddle, <laughs> skiddle my brush in it. So that's it. I'm just like squishing my brush in there. And then what I can do is, give me a second, I can test it out. And there you go. That's quite delicate. We'll go with that to start with. We can always add more paint to it to make it more vibrant, more opaque. I'm taking quite a lot of that off because these Cotman brushes do hold quite a lot of water. I want it to be a little bit drier just to pop in this little area here because it's quite delicate in there. Oh that's cute. And then I can be a little bit more wayward down here just because the the surface area is much larger and there's also quite a lot of that black line work from Carolina so you know you can kind of just go for it just squish it down on the paper this is actually my favorite shade of green it doesn't look the same on the camera it's a lot more muted in real life it looks quite bright on the camera but it's actually not so this is kind of like um the equivalent to doing a like an alcohol marker base on a colouring page and then doing the details in pencil. This is what this layer of 
layer, layer of paint is. This is like your marker base, except more fun. <laughs> I actually quite like doing that too. I was having the discussion on the Colouring Connection Facebook group the other day and I can't remember who it was. I think it might have been Melissa. Um, not that it, I think it was Melissa. Or was it Meredith? I can't remember. Anyway, I uh, I was saying that I don't know what it is about Hannah Lynn's pictures, but I, I, I like I have to colour them in marker. I, I, I wouldn't want to colour them in pencil. It's just like every time I open one of our books, my Copic markers start like squeaking at me from their shelf going, mm, you need to use me. And uh, the last one I did was from her steampunk special uh, in the Colouring Heaven magazines. And uh, I did that with a marker base, but I used pencil to like put in the details and I loved the way it turned out. So I've come to the conclusion that as long as I use a marker base in Hannah Lynn's books, I can, <laughs> I can still use pencil over the top of it. But it's nice to have that sort of mixed media between the two. Especially as well because I love my Copic markers. I should bloody hope so for the amount of money they cost. <laughs> And they are getting quite a lot of use. I was kind of frightened that I wasn't going to use them all that much. And it's a lot of money to pay out for something that you don't use very often. But I'm using mine at least once every two weeks, if not more than that. I would say probably once a week on average. So that's use enough for me and amongst everything else. The only supply that I've got that I don't use very much and that I wish I used more was my graphite tint pencils. But they are they're very specific um, because of the colour range and the fact that they they don't really come to life until you activate them with water and they're not, because they're graphite based, they're not as bright as the Inktense pencils. They have quite a sort of limited use, but that limited use is sketching nature scenes or things from nature, which is something I really like to do. So although I don't use them that often, I really like them, but they just have a bit more of a like a, a specialised purpose, I feel. And it's the only supply that I can truly say that about because things that I don't use, I tend to not keep. <laughs> so the other one is my Posca pens. I don't use them a huge amount, but I, I tend to use them to finish off pictures. It's a bit like gel pens. You know, I do use them, but I don't necessarily use them to create a piece of artwork. I've got one hanging on on the wall of the cave. I did a video on that as well. It was like geodes on a black background. I used the Posca pens for that. That was fun. They are really fun though. So there you go. That I feel like this green's really just, it's really adding to this picture now and everything seems to be going together okay, which is really nice. So we'll just get these large leaves done as well. Obviously we'll be able to get a bit more layering and shading with those because they are, they are just bigger, which is kind of cool. It's very quiet in the cave today. Our little Jack Russell, who she is at the vet, she's away getting surgery on her ear. Um, I did talk about this in, I think it was the last nameplate video, that she had a sore ear and I'd had to take her to the vet really quickly. And uh, the situation was that she's needed surgery, so she's in there today. By the time you see this video, it's going to be a couple of weeks later, so she will have had her surgery. And you'll probably know by now whether she's uh, whether she's okay or not. There is the concern because she is a lot older, because she's 14, the, the risk from a uh, general anaesthetic is much greater for an older animal, but also the smaller the animal, the greater the risk. And obviously she's only a little diddly dog. Um, so we're a little bit concerned, but she's in very good hands. We have a very good vet, so we'll wait to hear later today how she's getting on, whether I can go and pick her up and bring her home. But yeah, so uh, Jock's asleep here. I just had to look around to see who's with me. Jock's asleep here on the sofa bed and little Madam Puppy is in the kitchen. So, and she's asleep in, she's actually asleep in Wu's bed, but <laughs> she's asleep. So it's, it's all very quiet today, which is, it's kind of nice, but it's kind of strange. Usually it's just chaos. Right, uh, on to this number 54 now, which is this dark sort of, I would say it's more of an olive green. I don't know whether I want to go straight in with it. I maybe water it down a tiny bit because it might overpower that delicate green. So I'm only going to put two drops into my into my palette and just clean this brush off before I dip it in. I don't even know. I might try and use a smaller brush. You can tell I haven't planned this out. I'm just kind of like going by the seat of my pants. I'm going back to this little brush that we used to splodge in the, the blue background. 
just because it's it's much much smaller as I said this is a number three round so it's got a much finer point on it but just for going in here even at that wow that's a lot of paint oh there we go that's better and that is having exactly the desired effect and it doesn't have to be like an exact science everything's very loose and sort of chilled out here so I'm not going to spend too much time I've just realized something as well I'm just cutting myself off this plant down the bottom actually goes on over to the other page so while I still have the paint here in front of me I've said this already um I'm just going to go all the way across because it will be very difficult for me to get that exact dilution of that color of green again so I might as well do it while I'm here. The The plant that's on the other side, you know, on this side, I will use different colours for the leaves there because they are a sort of slightly different shape. So it'll look okay if I make them a different colour. Just get in the gaps here. Here we go around the blinking. Yeah, that's it. That's as good as this can. Right, anyway, I digress. Back to where I was. See, that's still a little bit damp, so that's actually soaking in really nicely. That's not going to be the case as I work my way around here. But that's okay. I'm going to try and fill that bit in there. I'm not actually going for like any sort of light source or, you know, I'm not doing anything like that. I just want to, to have a bit of variety in the leaves. Because again, they're not really, f they're not really like the centre point of the picture. And also again, just because of this loose art style, it's not, I don't feel as it's important to worry about the light source. I just want it to look pretty. <laughs> so I'm not not overly concerning myself with this. Now, it's a bit of a different story over here. Like, oh, you know, <laughs> what's going on over here? It's a bit busier in this corner. Interestingly, my second favourite paintbrush after that, uh, the, that Cotman brush, the, the, the number eight that I was using, my second favourite is like a double zero round and it's so small. It's like super teeny tiny and I love that brush. It's like I don't I don't seem to do things I either like things really really like brushes and pens and stuff. I like them really big or really tiny. I'm the same with fine liners as well. When I'm when I'm lining my own drawings, I I like the smallest size of Pigma Micron you can get and people are like, oh they're a pain, the nibs are you know far too delicate, they're too flimsy and you can barely see the line that you've drawn. But I really like that. I do go through a lot of them because they, I mean, they are, they're so fragile, but they are, it's because they're so small. And I do go through a lot of the pens, but I, I just like it. And I think it's because it's the closest thing I can get to like a sketchy pencil line that's not a pencil line. I hope that makes, that doesn't make me sound like a crazy person. Um, And that's just something that really appeals to me. So I suppose I, that's why I get excited about that tiny little paintbrush. <laughs> This one's pretty small, right enough, but it's not nearly as small as the other one. The level of detail, I think I, that's the other thing. That's exactly what it is. I always find that watercolour painting is not an exact science. And I think that's why I struggled with it so much to begin with, because I like things to be precise. And I like that precision you can get with a pencil. And having that tiny little paintbrush helps me get a sense of control and precision in the world of watercolour, which is probably the one of the most wayward mediums where, you know, you just kind of squish things down and it's like, ah, it's going to look okay. So I think that's maybe why it makes sense to me. Okay, dokie. Guys, I think we are finished. And there we go. There is our finished butterfly. That's quite pretty. Well, I'll tell you what, see for watercolouring in a colouring book. That was really good fun. I really enjoyed that. If you have enjoyed this and you would like me to do the other side and film it you can give me a thumbs up for the video and you can stick a comment down below if you uh feel that this is more like just the same as a color and chat and you're kind of neutral then that's fine too but yeah i had really good fun um i've just realized as well though i should really do these back to these two leaves they're kind of dried a bit now and just use this darker color again i see thought it was finished there and i wasn't false i was gonna say false start false finish <laughs> Ta da Okay, now we're finished. <laughs> yeah, guys, I really hope you've enjoyed this. I've had really good fun. Thank you so much for watching and listening. And we shall see you back in the cave very, very soon for another video. See you later, everyone. Bye for now.